Hey everyone, quick reminder that if you just want the audio for any of these videos, they are available on the Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis. It's my podcast. It's just basically my videos, but it's just the audio. It's now available on more platforms. It's on Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, or I guess not iTunes, Apple Podcasts. I don't know how any of that works. I'm not an Apple person, but... Um, it's available on more platforms. All the links to all the different platforms will be in the description below and most likely the top comment. There is a chance there will be an extra exclusive story over there when this video goes up. Don't hold me to it, but I'm hoping there will be. Thank you everyone for listening over here or over on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And if you check it out, let me know. I'd like to hear about it. Anyway, let's get into tonight's stories. I've seen a lot of people share their experiences here, so I wanted to share mine. I'd say the tapping started about five months after we moved in, that being my parents and my little brother Jacob. I was 15 at the time, and he was five. Being 10 years apart posed some challenges for us. I was never really able to play with him or him with me. Everything I did was too dangerous, or he wasn't old enough to do it. All the things that he did were boring or was just glorified babysitting. I didn't mind it too much, but I did take advantage of my parents not being home sometimes. I'd sneak into the attic, put on an old Halloween mask, and give him a good scare now and then. My parents put that to an end with a lock on the attic door. So, imagine my shock when one night while babysitting, Jared and I both heard something come from the attic. It was a tapping noise, but it didn't have a rhythm like a dripping faucet or even a banging tree branch. It was erratic. We muted the TV and listened in hard. I remember feeling Jacob shake out of fear. I decided to be a good big brother that night. It's probably just rats or something. This house is pretty old. Jacob felt like that was a fair enough assumption. I guess, because all he said was, oh, okay, and turned back to whatever show we were watching. It happened a few more times over that night, and while Jacob looked up at the ceiling each time, he didn't seem to be outwardly bothered by it. My parents got home a few hours later, put Jacob to bed, and the rest of the night was pretty uneventful. To be honest, I didn't tell my parents about the scratching in the attic, mostly because I'd forgotten about it, and because Jacob didn't seem too bothered. And it was until he started having night terrors. Not to sound too dramatic, but the first night Jacob woke us up with his screaming, I thought he was being murdered. Never had I, nor have I ever since, heard someone scream like that. All three of us, my mom, dad, and I ran into his room with no idea as to what could be in there. When we flicked on the lights and all we saw was Jacob in his bed, thrashing about, screaming about something at the top of his lungs. It took all three of us, me holding his legs, dad holding his arms, and mom holding his head to get him to stop flailing. We'd find out why he was yelling in a moment, but at the time we needed to make sure he didn't hit his head on the headboard or throw himself on the floor. It took what felt like an hour, but finally he calmed down, opened his eyes, and looked out to all of us. He looked tired. There were bags under his eyes, he was covered in sweat, and his face was bright red from screaming. Mom pulled him into a hug while Dad and I stared at each other in shock. Mom took Jacob out of the room, saying, I'm going to run him a bath. Can you clean those sheets and get the extras from the closet? We did as we were told and started getting his bed cleaned. As I was putting the sheets in the washer, my mom tapped me on the shoulder. I knew I was into something. She only did that when she was upset. She couldn't even bother raising her voice. She wanted to make sure she was heard so she'd get real close. She said, These little pranks you're pulling aren't funny, Carter. Your little brother's only five. He doesn't understand the jokes you pull on him. Do you know how long it took me to convince him to take his bed off the floor because you told him someone was living under it? I was confused. The last prank I'd pulled on Jacob was the Halloween one and my parents had settled that weeks ago at that point. What are you talking about? 
Now my mom looked confused. You told him there was some living in the attic. He said they heard scratching up there and that someone was up there looking at him and trying to get him. I was connecting the dots then. No, Mom. Jacob and I were watching a movie the other night, not a scary one, and we heard something in the attic. He looked afraid, so I told him it was probably rats, and he seemed fine after that. I never said anything like that to him, I swear. She looked skeptical of me, so I asked, Did he tell you that? She knew that he would have used my name if I was the one who did it. It was always like that. I'd scare him, and he'd run through the house yelling, Carter's trying to scare me, and I'd never hear the end of it. She knew I was right, and she dropped it and apologized. I was hopeful that was where all of it would have ended, but for the next week, Jacob would wake up screaming his lungs out about something in the attic trying to get him. It was at a point where he and I were missing school because he couldn't sleep through the night. He'd sleep all day, and with both parents working, I had to stay back and watch him, make sure he didn't have any more episodes. It was during one of these days that I found out what was happening in the house, and what eventually led us to move out. Jacob was asleep on the couch, and I was playing some silly game on my phone when I heard the scratching again. This time it wasn't in the same place. It was much quieter. When we first heard it, it was very noticeable, but now it sounded miles away. I got up off the couch, careful not to wake up Jacob, and started to go to different rooms in the house to see if I could pinpoint it. It wasn't in the kitchen, not the bathroom, not my room. It wasn't until I stepped into Jacob's room that I heard it as loud as I did the first time I heard it. The scratching was much more of a grinding now, and looking up at the ceiling, I found out why. There was a dark spot right above his bed. With each scratch, I could see something about to poke through until... Pop. A dark, black, bony finger poked through the ceiling. Some kind of viscous liquid followed it. Try my best not to piss myself, I ran back to the living room, grabbed Jacob, and took him outside. He was a little confused, but I told him I'd wanted to play outside for a bit and that getting some sun would make him feel better. When he was occupied with what toys were out there, I called both my parents and explained what I'd seen and heard. I told them that Jacob wasn't ill or just seeing things, and that they needed to get home as soon as possible. They were back within an hour. And before I knew it, we were in the car headed to my grandparents' house to stay for a few days. Dad said that he would stay back a few days to get things sorted with our landlord. He didn't talk about much what he saw in the house with any of us for a few years, but it was clear to Mom and I that he was very shaken when he came back. When he finally did tell us, neither of us wanted to believe them. He said he went up to the attic, only planning to grab a few family heirlooms and other important things, but was stopped in his tracks the moment his head entered the attic. He said, The scratching was persistent the whole time I was there, but I tried to ignore it, and I did. Until I got to the attic. There was something crouching in the far back, right where Jacob's room would be. It was gray, naked, wheezing. Its head kind of looked like a baby when it's first delivered. It had a slight cone shape to it. There were patches of hair hanging from it all over, and the hands were, they were more like talons. When it turned to look at me, I only saw it for a second, but I'm almost certain its eyes were black pits. That house was eventually rented out to another family, but from what I remember, they moved out after their one-year lease was up, and since then... It has remained mostly empty. Jacob is doing much better now. This was nearly ten years ago, and it seems like he's blocked most of it out. I don't know what the hell was in that house, and I'm glad I never found out. I was about 13 or 14 when this happened, so forgive me if it seems a little all over the place. It has been well over 10 years, but the fact that it has stuck with me for this long is, in a strange way, something special. 
We were about two weeks out from Christmas, something my aunt took very seriously when she was alive. She would cook for hours the day before and the day of, and spend weeks leading up to it decorating her house in the yard. It wasn't just because she thought it was fun. The night of Christmas Eve, everyone from her side and my uncle's side of the family would come by for dinner and dessert. I believe in the biggest years there were upward of 50 people there, stuffed into a three-bedroom, one-bath house. Luckily, they had a decent-sized yard as well. That was where most of us hung out. I have tons of fond memories hanging out there as a kid, but I was never really able to do much in the way of helping. I'd put a small decorative Christmas tree on the mantle, throw some ornaments on the tree, and call it a day. But, since I was older then, I could help out more, and I decided to. My aunt was to a point where she was moving slower, and couldn't do as much without getting very tired. Couple that with anxiety disorder, and you've got quite an unorganized mess with only a few days to figure it out. So, she asked my older brother and I for our help. Most of what we did was get things down from the attic, going up and down step ladders to put up lights, decorate the tree. She had two full-size trees. One was inside in the living room, the other one was in the sunroom and on a tree stand that spun slowly 360 degrees. Couple that with hundreds of smaller decorations, and you could see that we had our work cut out for us. So, for two days, I woke up at 7 or 8 in the morning, hung decorations, put up ornaments, and moved heavy boxes from room to room just to go home at 10 p.m. and stay up till 3 a.m. playing video games. Over those two days, I had gotten about six hours of sleep overall. So by day three, I'd had it. I helped for as long as I could before explaining that I was too tired to even stand. Man told me it was fine, and head home and get some rest. We lived within shouting distance of each other, so after a two-minute walk, I flopped down into my bed and was out within minutes. When I woke up, I couldn't move. I was lying on my stomach my arms under the pillow to prop my head up, and my feet were pointed in my closet. I didn't hear anyone in the house, and when I decided, okay, I'm awake, I tried to get up. But, nothing happened. Nothing moved, not even a finger. Now I was thinking that something was really wrong with me. I was worried I'd somehow manage to paralyze myself in my sleep and would stay that way until someone found me. My heart was pounding as I repeated to myself, just move, move something, but I couldn't. And then I felt something cold wrap itself around my right ankle. Out of sheer luck, my body recognized that as a problem and I was able to kick my foot and the sensation away. Once that foot was settled, though, my legs returned to their frozen state. Again, I repeated, move something, anything. But I couldn't budge. The grabbing sensation returned, only now it was on both ankles, and it was tighter. I tried like hell to kick my feet again, but it wasn't happening. Before I knew it, whatever had grabbed me started pulling me down the bed. I felt my shirt roll up beneath me. My head left the pillow and my arms started to straighten out. My mind was reeling. Was this really happening? I need to move. I need to move. Move. Finally, in an instant, my eyes opened and I quickly pulled myself to the wall and brought my legs to my chest. I made eye contact with something in my closet. It was low to the floor, just above a pile of dirty laundry, and looked to be a face, though all I could make out was dark black sockets for eyes and a bottomless black void of a mouth. There was no nose, no defining features at all, really. No eyebrows or hair on it anywhere. Despite this, I could see that it was angry with me. Its brow was furrowed, and it let out a strange growl-like scream before it just vanished. I called out for my mom, but as I would later learn, I was alone in the house. My parents and both of my brothers had left to help out my aunt. I did some research after that, simply typing, can't move when waking up, and came across sleep paralysis. 
From what I understand, it can be brought on by times of increased stress, lack of sleep, and a plethora of other things. I'm not sure what I'd be worried about at 13 or 14 years old, but six hours of sleep in two days probably didn't help all that much. Also, looking back, I'm not sure that's all it was. Of course, that's how it started, and I know visual and auditory hallucinations are part of it in severe cases, but... I remember being grabbed. Like I said, I I remember feeling the shirt I was wearing roll up underneath me. I have to believe something else was going on there. Sleepovers for me were a huge part of growing up. I loved going to friends' houses, seeing what their house looked like, what their family was like, It was something special. Of course, staying up all night and playing SNES, Genesis, or as I got older, PS1 and Xbox are all memories I hold fondly in my heart. I was recently thinking about it when a friend of mine asked if I'd wanted to spend some time over at their house and made the comment, you know, like a sleepover. Just that word sent memories flooding back. Most of them were great, but there was one that I hadn't realized had been locked away. Happened when I was eight, mid-2003. I'd been to Nico's house a handful of times before, never had a bad experience. Our families were in the same tax bracket, so we related on that front, and it made me so much more comfortable from the moment I walked into his house. It wasn't super clean, but it also wasn't dirty. It was lived in, you know? His mom was also incredibly nice, and did what she could to make us both happy while I was visiting. I was set to stay for about a week. We were on summer break from school and had planned out all things we were going to do over the week. Nico had some pretty dense woods behind his house, so we explored those. He had the new SSX game that we played for hours, and we even tried to build a lemonade stand, as cliche as that sounds. We made signs for it, but never got around to convincing his mom it was a good enough idea to go to the Home Depot and buy lumber. Probably for the best, looking back. By the fourth or fifth day, we'd started to run out of things to do. The video games weren't doing it, and it was getting too hot to go outside for more than an hour. It was when we were in the car with his mom going to get some groceries for the night that she made a suggestion. Why don't you boys tell each other some scary stories tonight? My friends and I did that all the time. It was a solid idea, and we took it in stride. That night, we shared stories of creepy dolls coming to life, monsters out in the woods by his house, and of course, a few ghost stories. After some time, though, I noticed that Nico seemed much more freaked out than I was. I asked him what was wrong, and he just started telling another story. You know, he said, my mom and I aren't the only ones that live out here. For context, Nico lived well out into the sticks of North Carolina. Think outskirts of Bun Level if you've ever been out there, you know what I mean. There's an old house a long way from here, but I heard some of the kids on my bus talking about it. They said the guy who lived there died in it. I think he walks around here at night looking for somewhere else to live. Nico wasn't joking. For the past few stories, we were getting more and more outlandish, even bringing zombies into the mix, but even as a kid I could tell he was really shook about what he was talking about. The room was silent for a moment before Nico spoke again, though I could barely hear him. I've seen him a few times, walking around outside. With that, he rolled over and didn't say another word. I was left there in a near pitch black room with the idea that someone was going to be outside at any point. And the worst part is that he took the side of the bed closest to the bedroom door. I was facing a window with various broken blinds, giving me a direct line of sight outside. I tried to shake off all the fear that was pent up, closed my eyes, and went to sleep. According to my glow-in-the-dark shark watch, I woke up at three in the morning. The way I woke up was strange, though. I didn't bolt upright like I just had a nightmare. I just opened my eyes and was wide awake. I was looking straight at Nico when I did, so I must have rolled over at some point. 
His eyes were wide open, too. He goes away after a while, he whispered, and at first I had no idea what he was talking about, but then I listened a little harder. There was a light tap, tap, tap on the window behind us, followed by a low and strained, Is anyone home? I can't find my home. I was shaking now, nearly in tears. It hit me that the story he told me before wasn't made up. He'd actually seen this person outside asking to come in. Nico kept saying, It goes away, I promise. Now through tears, as the tapping turned into a banging and the voice yelled, Is anyone home? Nico and I held on to each other for dear life that night, both shaking and crying until the noises stopped and the sun peeked through the broken blinds. I fell back asleep shortly after and woke up a few hours later. It was going to be my last afternoon there, so we decided to make the best of it. We played more outside, a few matches of SmackDown, Here Comes the Pain. Before I knew it, it was time to leave. Before I left, I told Nico and his mom that I'd left something in his room and ran to get it. In reality, I had everything and just wanted to be sure of something. I went to the window in Nico's room and got real close to the glass. To my absolute horror, there were finger and palm prints all over the outside. Just before you say anything, they were far too large for an eight-year-old. And Nico's mom was about 5'4", so it was in her hand, and Nico's dad was out of the picture. There was only one explanation. With that realization, I ran out of the bedroom, hopped into his mom's minivan, and we headed back to my house. I never told Nico about the fingerprints and never went back to his house after that. We still hung out after school and I talked about hanging out outside of school, but it just never happened. Even if it made me feel like a terrible friend, I was way too scared to go back over there. I lost contact with Nico after the next school year started. Him and his mom moved back to New York from what I understand. I still think about him a lot and that person or thing at the window that night. I hope Nico's doing okay. Him and his mom. I think it goes without saying that the 80s were a very different time. It was a hard time for my parents especially. I was only 9, but when my dad came home in 82, nearly in tears from being laid off, I knew exactly what that meant. My parents never really shielded me from the bad things that happened to us as a family, and I thank them for that, as it made me who I am today. I hardly hide anything from anyone. I've always believed that things are better left said than unsaid. I say all this as a way to kind of defend the actions of my parents and the story I'm about to tell. I've only told a few people, and most of the responses are, Your parents let you do that? Or where the hell were your parents? So let me explain. I was an only child, but I had a very close friend who lived across the street, Colin. Colin and I were like peas in a pod. We were constantly hanging out at each other's houses, going on dumb little adventures, and just generally being a pain in our parents' asses. It was one of those little adventures that I believe almost cost us our lives. Like I said at the top, this was the 80s. Pulling up the manhole cover we found in the woods and venturing down into the sewer drains sounded like the raddest thing since going to see a 3D movie. So we did. We gathered up a few flashlights, wrapped a shirt around our noses and mouths, and climbed the little ladder down. It was about what you'd expect. Pretty putrid and incredibly warm, even in the winter. But for us, it was like a private getaway. We could say and do whatever we wanted as long as we were back before dinner and didn't get into the water. We'd bring some stones down with us in our pockets to see who could throw one the furthest down the tunnel, bring down a deck of cards for games like war and what we called poker. In reality, we had no idea what we were doing. This went on for about a month before the novelty of it wore off, and Colin came up with an idea. I wonder how far it goes down. He said one day. <laughs> it was a crazy idea. We hadn't gone more than a few feet from the opening since day one. 
Of course, no good story exists without at least one bad decision. I told him I'd be willing to do it, but only if we had a way to lead ourselves directly back to the ladder. I knew there were offshoot tunnels, and if he wanted to look at those, I wasn't going to risk getting lost. He agreed, said his dad likely had a leftover bundle of rope that he could bring. We tie it to the bottom of the ladder, and then unravel it as we go, Hansel and Gretel style. The day of our adventure, we met at the manholes we always did. Colin had a flashlight and the string he'd promised to bring. It had to be at least 200 yards. It was a huge wad. With a deep breath, we started down the ladder. I can't explain it, but... The tunnel felt different that day. Obviously, it was nowhere for a kid to be, but something about it felt much more sinister all of a sudden. I remember thinking, we should probably just go back, but I never said anything to Colin. I wish I would have now. We'd been walking around 30 minutes before we saw another tunnel connected to our main one. There was one glaring issue, though. Only one of us would be able to get through. Colin offered, and like the great friend I was, I said, Okay, you go then, and let him. I was so freaked out at this point, and I didn't know why. It still hurts me that I was so willing to put Colin through what he went through, but... We tied some of the rope to his waistband, and he started crawling. I was making sure the rope was being fed without any snags or getting caught on the rough rock around us. It was only a few minutes before I called out. Do you see anything? He called back. Nothing yet. And the rope kept moving forward. At this point, I placed my flashlight in the tunnel towards Colin so I could hold onto the rope with two hands. I can't give you an accurate measurement, but Colin had gone far back enough to where I couldn't see him in the cone of light cast by the flashlight. Colin, I think that's far enough. There's probably nothing in there. He didn't answer. I tugged on the rope twice and waited for him to do the same. We agreed that this would be the way to communicate if something went wrong. My two tugs were to say, are you okay? He would pull once for yes and twice for no. I stood there in silence waiting for the tug until eventually I got something much stronger. The rope was yanked so hard it flew through my hands and caused rope burn. I threw it down in pain before realizing what I did and quickly picked it back up and began yanking back. Colin was a small kid, so I know there was something on the other side of that rope other than him. I didn't know if it was the adrenaline or just pure strength, but with three strong pulls I had Colin tumbling out of the tunnel and onto me. He was crying, screaming with blood coming from his head. I blocked out a lot of what happened next, but somehow we were able to get back to the ladder and make it to my mom, who got in touch with Colin's mom and took him to the hospital. Meanwhile, I was tasked with explaining everything. As you'd expect, my mom was not happy. She forbade me from seeing Colin for a month, and once Colin was out of the hospital and back home safely, his mom did the same. We still saw each other at school, so it wasn't the worst punishment in the world. I think they were just happy we were safe, especially Colin. We didn't talk about what happened in the tunnel at school. Colin told his other friends and teachers that he'd just fallen off his bike and everyone took it as truth. Hell, he wouldn't tell me until we were much older and drunk. The manhole and the tunnels in it had been out of commission for some time. The city welded it shut after my mom threw a fit about kids being able to get in. That also meant that what was in there couldn't get out. Colin told me what he'd saw when he'd come over to my apartment for a few drinks and just to catch up, but we ended up having a heart-to-heart -heart about the tunnel. I told him I was sorry for making him go in, but he insisted it was okay. I'm just glad you got me out when you did, he said. You wouldn't believe what the hell I saw in there. I took a swig and said, try me. He sat there for a moment, looking to the ceiling for an answer, searching for the words that would make sense. It was a man, or it was at some point. He was tall, gaunt, 
looked like he was barely holding it together that he'd already lost it. When I put my flashlight on him, his skin reflected it straight back. He was he was so pale I could follow the veins in his arms all the way down to his fingertips from 15 feet away. His eyes caught the light, but he didn't look away like you or me would. He just kept staring, and his eyes reflected it like a cat's does. He was holding the rat, or what was left of it anyway, in his mouth while it dripped with blood. That's about when you tugged the rope. He didn't like that. Lunged at me, grabbed me by my wrist so hard I thought they may break. Colin was nearly crying now. I can't thank you enough for pulling me out of there, man. I know you feel guilty about all this, but at the end of the day, we're still alive. And to be fair, it was my stupid idea to go in there in the first place. I didn't know what to say then, and I don't know what to say now. I don't want to believe him, but I remember the look on his face when he came out of that tunnel. Our parents still don't know exactly what happened. They have a much more truncated version. We were playing down in the sewers. Colin slipped and hit his head. It was enough to get them off our backs about it. Colin and I still get together from time to time, but I've been blowing him off lately. Every time I see him, I can't help but think about what happened all those years ago. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed uh, the true stories tonight. It's always fun to do these every once in a while, just kind of switch things up. Slow down a little bit. I know it's a little bit of a shorter video, but I thought these ones were good enough to share. I'll be keeping an eye out for more in the future. And of course, if you have any scary or weird antics you got into as a kid, let me know in the comment section below and maybe I'll read your story for one of these videos. While you're down there commenting, I just want to give a quick thank you to all of our $5 patrons and members. Absinthe Alice, Amethyst, Matt and Barry, Bubbly Panda, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Furious Weasel, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Jennifer Dameron, Jesse Jess, Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrot Cat, Kathy Flanning, Lee Riggs, Laura Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nora Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, PJ Masks, Ray Clegg, Sentinel, The New On Gome 24, Tiger Princess, Tish Love, Triumph, and finally Victoria Step. Thank you all so much for the continued support. I really, really appreciate it. Hope you all have a wonderful day, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are. And as always, stay safe out there.